Well, I want to ask you today to turn in your Bibles to three different passages of Scripture. I hope that don't fake you out. But uh, I want you to turn to three different passages in your Bible today. And uh, I'll be spending more time probably in the last passage that I'm going to give you. But first of all, turn in your, your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter number 11. And when you find Luke, chapter number 11, I want to encourage you, if you will, to find the book of Acts, chapter 3. Luke, chapter 11, Acts, chapter number 3. And then, thirdly, Romans, chapter number 1. That's going to get your Bible the best workout it's had all week right there. Uh, but I uh, think it's important that we look at these three passages of Scripture today. And when you find your place, um, you may stand. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, if you haven't found it, I just recommend you go ahead and stand and look intelligent right where you are, <laughs> like you have found it. <clears throat> and uh, Luke chapter number 11, verse number 5. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Now I want to call your attention to a phrase today, and I'm going to be talking about it. I want to call your attention in verse number 6 to the last phrase, and I have nothing to set before him. Now hold your place and move over to the third chapter of the book of Acts. We begin reading in verse number 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I want to call your attention to a phrase here in verse number 6. Where Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I to thee. Lord, thank you now for our moments together. I want to thank you for the gracious, wonderful hymns of the faith, which has reminded us so truthfully and so powerfully about the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. And now in these few moments, I want you to help me to be a blessing. And I'm asking for the Holy Spirit of God to minister through me to this people that you will give us an intake of hearing, receptiveness, and that the Spirit of God may be allowed to do His work in all of our lives because we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 11, and in the book of Acts, chapter number 3, we find two great needs. In Luke, chapter number 11, a man has come to the house of a friend. 
and he desires some bread from his friend. However, his friend does not have bread to give him. So his friend goes to his neighbor's house and knocks on the door and says, I have a friend who's come to my house, but here's the phrase, I have nothing to set before him. Now I want you to hold on to that thought for just a moment. A man had a legitimate need. He goes to the house of a friend. He needs bread for his family. And he says to his friend, I have nothing to sit before my friend. In the book of Acts chapter 3, we find another individual who has a tremendous problem. According to the fourth chapter of the book of Acts, this man was above 40 years of age. He was born lame. And for practically all of his life, he has been dependent upon someone to pick him up and to carry him every day of his life outside of the temple in Jerusalem. He has sat there with a little cup in his hand. And as the people made their way into the temple, he would beg for some money to keep body and soul together. Now what's so amazing about the story in Acts chapter number 3 is that he's been there for so long. And that secondly, so many people have passed him by. There's a contrast there that I want to call your attention to before I move into the message. And it is the place where they brought this cripple. The Bible says they bring him in front of the beautiful gate. That gate, historians tell us, was one of the great wonders of the world. It was made out of fine Corinthian brass. They had imported this material and they had constructed this gate on site. This gate was something like 80 feet tall and 65 feet wide. And it would take 20 some people in the morning to open the gate and 20 some people in the evening to close the gate. And they said what made it one of the wonders of the world was that when the sun would shine on the gate, that it would give off a color. We would use today's colloquialism, you don't need sunglasses to look at it. But it was beautiful. It was so beautiful that people came from everywhere to see it. But what they didn't see was right out in front of that gate, a man with a great need, crippled from his mother's womb. They come to look at the gate. They come to worship in the temple. But they have no time for the cripple outside of the gate. Is there not a lesson there for us to learn today? Is there not a lesson there for us to understand that outside of the doors of this building, all up and down the highways around us and the community around us and everywhere we go, there are those who are spiritually crippled in sin, who are lost and who are on their way to a Christless eternity. And God help us not to get so caught up in the beauty of the building and the comforts of worship that we forget in reality what this is in here is a gas station where we come to fill our tanks for the express reason of helping the multitudes of Christians lying outside of these walls crippled by sin. If we miss that, we have missed our purpose for existence. In Luke chapter 11, there's multitudes of people today who identify with this neighbor. He said, I have a friend that's come to my house, but I have nothing to set before him. 
I want to raise the question today. I want to help us today, hopefully, to become conscious of the souls around us. How do you answer the question today pertaining to people that you come in contact with who are lost? Family members? Neighbors next door? People you work with? People you come in contact with? Do you have to say with the man in Luke chapter number 11, I have nothing to set before you? Or can you say with Peter in Acts chapter 3, I have something to give you. I can give you that which I also received. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. Peter had something to give. But the man in Luke 11 had absolutely nothing to give. Do you have something to give to that lost loved one? Let me illustrate it this way. Let's just suppose that someone knocks on your door today and they say, you know our neighbor down the street? Yes. They've had a stroke or they've had a heart attack. They're in critical condition over to hospital. And they have asked for you to come to their bedside because suddenly it's dawned on them they're about to go into eternity and they're not saved. And so your neighbor knows that you are a member of Berean Baptist Church. And right now, the only thing that matters to them is where they're going to be, possibly in a few minutes, few hours, few days at the most, because they're in critical condition. They want to make sure, hopefully before they die, somebody can come to their bedside, somebody can step in that hospital room and give them what they need. Let's just suppose that they send for you and you're thinking about it on the way over to the hospital and you walk in the room and the family's there around the bed and your neighbor's there on the bed and you walk up to the bed and you see the desperation in their eyes. You see there's kind of a scared look on their face and they grab your hand and they squeeze your hand and they say, please, in so many words, I hope you have something to give. Like Peter, I hope you've got something that you can give them that will make a difference on where they're going to be shortly. I hope you know what to say. I hope you know what to do. But let's just suppose you look at your neighbor on the bed and you say to your neighbor, well, I feared this hour was going to come. You know how you've always lived. You know, I've, I've tried to warn you that you ought to get in church, and I've tried to tell you that you owe it to your family to get it. Listen, that's not what they need. They don't need that now. Maybe sooner, but they don't need that now. Let's just suppose that you say to them something like this. Well, I've studied all of the great philosophers of ancient Egypt, and, and uh, I've, I've studied all of the Grecian philosophers, and I've read Aristotle and Socrates, and, and uh, what they tell us to do is do your best and hang on and uh, try to live a good, clean life. But, but, hey, they don't need that. That's not what they need. They don't need a lesson in philosophy. I'll tell you what they do need. They need somebody like Peter who came up to that crippled man and such said, said this, such as I have. Now, let me ask you something. What have you got right there? Such as I have. If you are called upon to get to that hospital bed, do you have what that individual needs to determine where they're going to be shortly? Can you go to the hospital bed and say, such as I have, give I unto thee? Or would you have to go to the hospital bed in emptiness like the man in Luke 11 and say, I have nothing to set before you? It's a serious time. It's a serious moment. I never will forget it. About 1 o'clock in the morning. My wife, who's in heaven, I remember her waking me up out of sleep. And I remember my wife saying to me, honey, I'm troubled about my soul. 
I, I remember it as if it happened just yesterday, and she said, I can't sleep. I, I'm troubled that if something happened to me, I don't know where I'm going. Would you help me know I am saved? And I remember getting up that night, walking with my wife out of the bedroom, down a little hallway, into a little kitchen, uh, into a little dining room next to the kitchen in a little four-room house. We had a oil circulator sitting in there uh, warming the house, and we had a big old family Bible on the on the coffee table. I remember getting that big old Bible and opening it up, laying it on the sofa, and we got down on our knees in front of the sofa. I went down the road in the Bible and I showed her what the Bible said that we've all sinned and that Jesus came and took our place and that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord could be saved. I went right down those passages of Scripture. You know what that means? Thank God and I give the Lord the credit. <clears throat> I had something to give her. I didn't have to approach that iron and say, like Luke 11, somebody's come to my house and I have nothing to give. I had something to give her. I gave her the gospel, the good news that Jesus died. She'd call upon his name. He'd forgive her and he would save her. And she started praying and she started crying. And I started praying and I started crying. And we almost needed a mop and a mop bucket to get the tears up off of the floor because we was happy. You know why we were happy? We were happy because that night my wife made a determination. I'm not going to go to hell. I want to know how to be saved. I was able to take the Bible and I was able to win her to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. And when I was following the ambulance north on Highway 601 towards Hoos Memorial Hospital, after they picked my wife up out of an accident uh, where she'd been hit by a tractor trailer, the only thing that mattered to me as we went north on Highway 601 was that night at 1 o'clock in the morning when she awakened me and I went in the living room and told her how to be saved. That was all that mattered. That was prominent in my mind. That was predominant in my heart that I knew where she was headed because I had something to give her. I had something to set before her. I had something to tell her. Let me ask you today, which one of these two people do you represent? In Luke chapter 11, I have nothing to set before him. In Acts chapter 3, such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. I hope today you've got something to give him. I hope today you don't wait until it's too late. Let's just suppose, by way of illustration, that there's a man on death row down in Raleigh. And let's just suppose that the governor of North Carolina gives him a reprieve. And let's just suppose that the governor knows you and that person on death row down there is a person that's a friend of yours and the governor's given a pardon and the governor says to you, I'm going to get this pardon to you and I want you to take this pardon and give it to the warden because I have pardoned your friend. They're on death row. It's just a matter of a few days, your friend's going to be put to death. But I have pardoned your friend, and I want you to take this pardon, and I want you to give this pardon to the warden. And so you get the pardon. And let's just suppose that you're on your way home, and your wife asks you to stop to the grocery store, and you stop at the grocery store, you pick up some milk, you pick up some articles, uh, and you get home, uh, and you lay the articles on the cabinet, and you happen to remember, I've got some bills I need to pay. And so you go get your checkbook out, and you get the bills out, and you sit there, and you write these bills, and uh, while you're writing the bills, the phone rings, and one of your friends has called you on the telephone and said, I just got two cheap plane fares and I'm going to Florida to play a couple of rounds of golf and spend a day and I'm coming back. And I wonder if you'd like to go down there. I, I've done bought the tickets. You're welcome to go. You say, man, that's great. Sure, I'll be glad to go with you. And so you get on the airplane, you fly down to Florida, you play a couple of rounds of golf. Uh, you came back, you come back in a few hours uh, 
and uh, you go in back to your house and you get you a cup of coffee and and you pick up the newspaper and you decide you're going to read the latest news and while you're looking at the newspaper suddenly on the front page something jumps off of that page and almost as if it slaps you in the face. On the front page of the newspaper, there is an article about your friend who had been pardoned by the governor who has just been put to death the day before. Suddenly you remember, I had that pardon in my coat. You start wearing the same coat and you reach in your pocket and you pull out the pardon and you look at it and you get to thinking, oh, my soul. My friend had been pardoned, but I never delivered the message. My friend died because I didn't deliver the message. My friend is, has, has been put to death. I had the pardon in my pocket, but I got busy doing other things. My friend is dead. My friend is probably in a Christless eternity. I did not deliver the pardon to the warden. Hear me well. Everybody you come in contact with today, everybody you come in contact with tonight, everybody you come in contact with tomorrow, every individual you meet this week, every family member you get around when you have a birthday party, or you get around at resurrection time, or, or Christmas time, or special family time, if those people have never been saved, hear me well, to a great degree it may be our problem because they have, there is a pardon available to them. They don't have to go to hell. They don't have to die lost. But the Lord has given us the words of the pardon to deliver to them, to keep them from dying lost and going into a Christless eternity. My question to us today is, we got anything to say before them? My question to us today is, do we, do we have, are we looking at them? Are we thinking in our mind, I don't have anything to give them. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead them. I don't know how to win them. Look, it's not the Lord's will they die lost. God saved you. God saved me. God saved us. And he has called us uh, as a church and as a group of individuals uh, to deliver the pardon. People are condemned. John 3, 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We are the group, we are the people that God has placed the pardon for our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends, people we don't know. He has placed the pardon in our hands. Uh, we must not get too busy uh, to talk to them about their never dying soul. We must not just think, well, one of these days I'll get around to it. While we're getting around to it, they may die and they may go to hell forever. The man in Luke 11 said, I have nothing to set before him. Peter said, such as I have, give I unto thee. Now turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, our third passage of Scripture, for just uh, the next two hours or so. The Apostle Paul, I think we would all admit, had something to give. I want you to notice with me, please, in Romans chapter number 1, I want you to note in verse number 10, Paul said, making request, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Paul's saying, I believe it is the will of God that I come to you. 
And I am praying that God will give me good traveling mercies and allow me to visit with you and to see you. Hear me well. He had a purpose. His purpose in going to Rome, hear me, was because he had something to give. And I want you to note with me what the Bible says in verse number 11. For I long to see you. Now notice the next phrase. That I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. Notice what he says. I want to get over there. I want to see you. Why? I've got something to give you. Listen, Paul was not going to Rome as a seeker of truth. He was going to Rome as a possessor of truth. You know, I get amazed. I get around people sometimes. I'm not talking about anybody in the church, people I meet out in public. And uh, they always want to impress me by the amount of Bible study and by they're studying the book of Daniel and they're trying to figure out which beast is here and which beast is there, here beast, there beast, there, where be here. And they're trying to put the revelation and the book of Daniel together and nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. I love to study. I've studied for over half a cent. Nothing wrong with that. But let me ask you a question. And this is what I always want to ask them. You've been studying. I like what Dr. Lakin used to say. He said, we train in Sunday school. We train in training union. And we train here and we train there. He said, you know, every once in a while, maybe we ought to go to war. Maybe every once in a while, we ought to take what we've heard all through these years and just maybe put it in shoe leather. Maybe we need to put it in practice. Uh, uh, maybe God didn't give us all this information for us to sit and sigh and soak. Maybe God is trying to put something in our cranium that will challenge us to do what he called us to do. It's called the Great Commission to try to keep somebody out of hell. That's what he's called us to do. And Paul said in this verse of Scripture, I long to be over there. This is, this is powerful. In verse number 11, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now, the lost person needs a spiritual gift of salvation. The lost person, more than anything else in this world, needs to know how to be saved. And it is our responsibility to set something before them. It is our responsibility to have something to give them. Now, notice what he said in verse number 14. Here's the reason he said, I want to get over there. He said, I'm a debtor. I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. Now, what does all of that mean? Well, I can tell you exactly what it means. It simply means that he is a debtor to everyone. I hope you heard what I just said. He is a debtor to everyone. When you talk about the Greeks, you're talking about the crowd that's the up and outers. You're talking about the great philosophers. You're talking about the, the rich, the educated. You're talking about the people that would live on that side of town uh, uh, where there's no slums. You're talking about the people that would live in the half a million dollar and uh, homes forward, million dollar, two million dollar, five million dollar. Uh, these were the people that was looked upon in Paul's day as the who's who. These were the, this was the intellectual crowd. This is the crowd that would sit around and philosophize over philosophy. This, this was the crowd uh, that was way up there in society. They were highly respected in society. Paul said, I'm a debtor to them. Paul said, it's my responsibility to witness to the lawyer. Paul said, it's my responsibility to witness to the doctor. Paul said, it's my responsibility to witness to the CEO. Paul said, it's my responsibility to tell that person, uh, no matter what their position in life, they need to be saved. Paul said, I've got something to give to the Greek. I'm a debtor to the Greek. You know, sometimes we look at people's positions and we kind of draw back and say, wow, I don't want to offend them. God's offended if we don't. I'd rather offend them than offend the Lord. 
Who's going to tell them? Are the lost people going to tell lost people how to be saved? No, it takes God's people to tell the lost people how to be saved. Paul said, I'm a debtor. He said, since I've gotten saved, he said, I owe it to the Greek to tell them about the Lord. And he said, I can't hardly wait to get over there because I've got something to give to them. You read the book of Acts, he stood before kings. You read the book of Acts, he stood before uh, the rich crowd. You read the book of Acts, he stood before the poor crowd. You read the book of Acts, he stood before all of the crowds. Uh, he said, I've got something to give. And he said, I've got to get over there. I've got something to share with you. I want you to know something about the grace of God. My friend, that is our commission. We must be like the Apostle Paul. He said, I can't hardly wait to get over there. I've got something to give you. Do you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could just, if we had the means to hand people uh, all day long certified checks for $1,000? Well, if we announced on our radio station we're going to be giving away $50,000 to the first 50 people that comes, they'd be wrecks all up and down 109. By the way, there's only two kinds of people found on 109 and now. That's the quick and the dead. And we said we're going to give away $50,000 to the first 50 people that comes on the property. Man, you they'd be beating the doors down to get here. Could I tell you that we've got something that's of more value than $50,000? to give to the people of this community and where you live and where you work. Uh, we've got something to set before them. You know what we've got to set before them? The only hope they ever have in this world before they make their exit, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And my friend, that's worth more. Jesus said it this way, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, listen, salvation is worth more than 10 million worlds like this, because once you get saved, thank God you don't have to worry about dying and going to hell. Once you get saved, you know you're heaven bound. Once you get saved, your sins are forgiven. There's only one person that can do that, and that's the Lord. And he has called the church uh, to be the instrument to set something before them that will help them meet the master. May we not say like the man in Luke 11, I don't have anything said before. God help us to set something in front of them. But notice what he said, I'm debtor to the Greeks. But notice, secondly, he said, I'm debtor to the barbarian. Now, you're talking about the people that are way down the totem pole. Here's the people that they live on the wrong side of the track. This is the poor crowd. Uh, this is the crowd that, in many instances, you might not want to be around. This is the crowd uh, that you might even, and sad to say many, might even look down on. This is the crowd uh, that are certainly uh, nowhere near the Greek crowd. This is the down and out crowd. This is the despised crowd. This is the crowd that chooses to live a substandard life. Paul said, not only am I a debtor to the philosopher, he said, I'm a debtor to the poor man. He said, I'm a debtor to the person on the other side of the tracks. He said, it is my responsibility to get to them because he said, I have something to give them. My friend, we've got something to give to them. It's worth more than silver and gold. It's worth more than this world. It's the greatest message of the world. It's the greatest message in the universe. Paul said, I long to get over there. Notice what else he said in verse number 12, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you. And here's what he said. He said, I want to get over there so we can sit down together. You talk to me about your faith. I want to talk to you about my faith. And we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship. Let me tell you how we can determine how spiritual we are and how close to the Lord we are. That is by the things that we most like to talk about. You say, well, what about politics? What about it? Poly means many, ticks mean blood, blood suckers, and we got many blood suckers. Amen. If you look at the ratings of Congress and the, lady, the ratings of uh, the news media, you put them both together, 
and you still have to jump up to touch bottom. But let me tell you something. The greatest thing we have to talk about is not the weather, it's not politics. The greatest thing we have to talk about is what Paul said. He said, I long to be over there. I got something to give you. And we want to just sit down and talk about our mutual faith. He said, we just want to sit down and have some good fellowship around the Word of God. We want to sit down and have some good fellowship talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. When's the last time you got up with your friend and your friend said to you or you said to your friend, you know, I've just been thinking about how good God's been to me today. Let's just talk about the goodness of God. Now listen, you talk about the negative things. We're, we're born in the negative case and the kicking it mood. We're born with a billy goat religion, kicking it one end and butting it the other. But let me tell you something. When the Lord Jesus Christ sits enthroned on the dormitories of our soul, and we know we're saved and we're going to heaven and any minute we might show up there, my friend, that ought to cause us, that ought to inspire us, that should motivate us sometime between Sundays and not have to do it just in the house of God and be reminded of it in the house of God. We ought to be able to talk to somebody about our mutual faith. We ought to go up to somebody and say, you know something, bless God, it's good to be saved. And they ought to be able to look back at you and thank God as if they're looking 10,000 miles away and say, you know you're exactly right. I've just been thinking today about what it means to be saved. I'm so glad my sins are gone. I'm so glad I know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Hey, by the way, I want to tell you what Jesus did for me this week. I was praying about this, and I want to tell you, God answered my prayer. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God's been so good to me. I'm so glad I'm saved. And you just get together out there, the two of you in the middle of the grocery store or somewhere else, and you just have an old shouting sp uh, 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 spell because you are talking about your mutual faith. You've got something to give because you're saved. You don't have, you're not of that crowd that has nothing to put before the person in need. You're running over. Brother Cup gets blessed. Sister Saucer gets the overflow. Paul said, I, I long to be there. I want to sit down and talk about our mutual faith. Now I want you to notice here, and I'm going to, I'm hurrying to a close. Three times the apostle Paul says, I am. Look at verse 14. He said, I'm a debtor. In verse 15, he said, I'm ready. And in verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Now, I don't have time to labor it. I drop it in your heart for your further study. But here's what I want to say. Paul said, here's what I've got to give. He said, I'm not going to the person in need and have nothing set in front of him. Paul said, such as I have, give I unto you, like Peter said in Acts 3. Now listen closely. Listen closely. Here's what Paul said he had to give. I want you to notice it, please, in verse number 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. That's what he had to give. Hey, that's all he had to give. That's all he needed to give. You know, I learned something in studying the Word almost every time I open the Bible. And I've been studying this thing, and I've tried to be a student of this book down through the years. But I came across a new meaning recently for something here that really blessed me. And it was the word power. I want to drop it in your heart. In verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God. Now, one of the words for power is the word dunamis. It's the word we get our word dynamite from. But in early days, we're told that our word today, prescription, came from the word power. Prescription. And I found that to be very interesting. And let me illustrate it this way. It may not help you, but you don't mind if I get blessed, do you? Let's just suppose that I have developed a crippling arthritis. I'm living in constant pain. My joints are swelling and my fingers are drawing and my body is feeling the consequences of this terrible, terrible disease. Somebody tells me of a doctor in the distant field 
a distant state or a distant country that has developed a prescription. And that if I can make my way there, he can probably cure me. So because of the pain and because of the disease, I find out where he's at, I get a ticket, I fly to the destination. I finally get in his office. He examines me. He said, yeah. He said, I see what you've got. He runs all of the tests. He said, I see. He said, I got a prescription. He said, I have developed this prescription, and this prescription, if you'll take it regularly, and you'll take it with longevity, it will heal your infirmity. Now, first of all, I'd be an idiot not to take it. If I can find something in this prescription that will heal my body and I don't take it, I've got more problems than arthritis and rheumatism. I follow his orders. I go get the prescription. I start taking it. And after a period of time, I notice I don't have as much pain in my body. After a more extended time, I notice that my joints are not swelling like they used to. And about 12 months later, I never didn't know that I had this arthritis or this rheumatism. That prescription cured me. And I'm so happy. I'm so thankful. This prescription made me well. I'm walking down the street one day, and I look across the street on the other side of the sidewalk, and I see a man over there like this. And his hands are drawn, and I say to myself, that looks like what I used to have. I'm going to make my way over there because I want him to experience what I've experienced. If this medication will do this for me, I believe there's a possibility if he's got what I've got, this medication will help him. So I make my way over there and I introduce myself to him. I explain my situation. I said, it seems as if you may have arthritis or rheumatism, bad case. He said, oh yeah. He said, I'm constantly getting worse. I want to say to him, I got something said before you. I've got a prescription, power. I've got a prescription, and if you'll take this prescription, I can tell you what is, oh, I'm about to have a spell. I can tell you what this prescription's done for me, and I want to share it with you, and the, the way it's helped me, I believe there's a possibility it's going to help you. And so if you'll, if you'll let me, I'll share this with you. And you go to your doctor or whatever, and you tell him this is what you want. Or you go to this doctor here and that I went to, and you tell him this is what you want. And I can promise you that if you'll take this prescription, that you will be healed. And in about a year from now, you will be walking straight. In about a year from now, you won't even know that you have this rheumatism. And he thanks me with tears coursing down his cheeks. And he said, I'm so glad that you love me enough to come over here and tell me about this. Uh, listen, the gospel is the power of God uh, unto salvation. Uh, look, I was all bent over, weighted down with sin. Uh, I was in the pain and the discomfort of the devil's zone. Uh, but one day he came down the aisle with a cross over his shoulder uh, and he said, what can I do for you? I said, do for me what I can't do for myself. Uh, and bless God, I got up from that altar and stood straight uh, and my sins were gone and the pains of the past life. Uh, had been taken away from me uh, and my life was made anew. I became a new creation uh, in Christ Jesus. Uh, and ever since then, uh, I see the people in this world, they're bent over uh, and they're decrepit by sin uh, and they're going towards hell uh, and there's nothing in this world uh, that can help them. There's nothing in this world uh, that can uh, cause them uh, to have that condition settled and finalized uh, outside of the gospel. It is the power of God. It is the prescription of God uh, that can forgive their sins uh, and set them straight uh, and put a strong, strong step in, the, uh, in their journey towards glory uh, and it, enable them to know the same Savior that we know uh, and do for them what he's done for us. Uh, we got a prescription today. It's called the power of God uh, and it's the power of God unto salvation. Uh, it's the only thing that can make whole, uh, people whole. It's the only thing that can make sin sick people well. Uh, it's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, we need to step across the street and we need to give it to the people around us who are lost because we've got something to give. I said we got something to give. 
Hallelujah. And praise the Lord forever. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Gypsy Smith or not. Gypsy Smith was from England. A gypsy. They traveled in these caravans. But one day Gypsy Smith got saved. Gypsy Smith was a little short guy with a handlebar mustache. He traveled across the ocean 40 some times to come to America to preach the gospel. Dr. John R. Rice, founder of the Sword of the Lord, was in Fort Worth, Texas back in the 40s, 30s or 40s. And he heard that Je Gypsy Smith was going to be preaching at the big First Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Rice said he went to the service that night and he watched this little short guy, Gypsy Smith, with that handlebar mustache. He watched him stand in the pulpit and preach for souls. He said, I watched Gypsy Smith stand up there and challenge us that this message is so important we must not waste time. We must do it and we must do it now. He said, I watched that gypsy as he stood up there and preached about this great salvation. And he said, I watched the tears running down his face and dropping off on his suit. He was so burdened for souls. Amen. And he said to us, you must not wait. It's so urgent. You need to walk out of this building tonight and the first person you come to, you need to tell them about Jesus. Dr. John R. Rice said, I sat there and listened to this gypsy preach about the urgency of getting people saved and I watched the tears as they ran down his face, dropped off on his coat. He said, he challenged me that night like I've never been challenged before. And he said, after the invitation and dismissal, Dr. Rice said, I decided I'm going to get out of this building and the first person I meet outside of this building, I'm going to talk to him about Jesus. Dr. Rice said, I had to catch a cab. He said, I went out. The cab was, cab's out there in the line waiting. He said, I went out and told the guy I wanted to get in the cab. He said, Squeeze, I got in the cab and sat down. He said, I said to the cab driver, hey, sir, I got a question for you. Have you ever been saved? The cab driver said to Dr. John R. Rice, it sure is funny that you should ask me that question. Yes, I am saved. Dr. Rice said, well, sir, let me ask you a question. How long have you been saved? He said, just a few minutes. He said, there was some little old short fellow came up to me with a handlebar mustache. <laughs> he just stuck his head inside of my car a while ago, and he said he had urgency written all over his face. And he said to me, do you know you're saved? And he said, I told him I didn't. And he said, he told me how. And he said, I got saved. And Dr. Rice said, he was following up on what he was preaching in the pulpit. He beat me to the first man on the street and won him to the Lord. My question to us today, are we like the man in Luke 11 that have nothing to set before him? Or are we like Peter in Acts chapter 3 when he said, such as I have, give I unto thee? Do you have something to give today? Do you have something to offer the lost person, the lost man, the lost woman, boy or girl? Do you have something to offer them today? Has anybody ever offered it to you? Have you been saved? Listen, the most important thing of the, of the church is keeping people out of hell. We're standing with our heads bowed and our, our eyes closed. Do you have something to set before him? The man said, they came to my house, but I have nothing to set before him. But Peter said, such as I have, give I unto thee. Peter had something to give. Do you have something to give to your lost loved ones? Do you have something to give to your lost neighbor? Listen to me closely. This is the greatest choice you will ever have to make in your life. The choice of what shall I do with Jesus? If you're not saved, 
The greatest decision you'll ever make is to trust him. If you are saved, the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Are you going to set him before somebody? Grab you some tracks on the table as you go out the door. Hand them to somebody today. But most importantly, during this invitation, I want you to make up your mind today. By the grace of God, I'm going to give a verbal assent today to the gospel to somebody. Somebody at the table where I eat lunch, the waitress, or somebody standing in the lobby today waiting to eat. I'm going to tell somebody today, I've got the prescription. I know what it's done for me. I'm going to give that prescription to somebody else. It's the power of God unto salvation. We're singing. As they sing, I want to challenge you to get around this altar today and say, Lord, I want that prescription in my life to the extent, in my life to the extent that I'll not be ashamed to give up the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, in this auditorium today, hundreds of people are represented, family members, Friends, many of whom, no doubt, have never been saved. And I realize you've saved us and give us the prescription to give somebody else. Help us to do it. Help us to determine to do it. Help us to have a desire to do it. Help us to have a willingness to do it. In Jesus' name. You're thinking about somebody right now. Would you come around this altar and just call their name? And say, Lord, I want you to convict that person. I want you to save that person. Lord, I want you to give me the ability to witness to that person. Lord, I want you to help me to have the power upon my life to tell somebody about Jesus. Would you do that as we sing this stanza of invitation? You listen to me. They're going to sing one more stanza and we're going. Hear me well. Dr. R.G. Lee, the pastor for multitudes of years, Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, tells this story, true story. A local schoolhouse caught on fire and the children were pinned inside of that building and couldn't get out. And the parents made their way to the schoolhouse and one man standing outside and through the flames, he could see his son. Through the flames, he could see his son. And he started to go in and the men grabbed him and said, you can't go in there. Not only are they going to be consumed, you'll be consumed if you go in there. And he wrestled and tried to get free. And his son, Daddy, Daddy, can you save me? Daddy, Daddy, can you save me? Daddy, Daddy, can you save me? He watched his own son, his own flesh and blood, as he wilted like a flower in the flame. And went out into eternity. Dr. Lee said that man day and night from that point forward, all he could hear was, Daddy, Daddy, can't you save me? Daddy, Daddy, can't you save me? In just a few months, he grieved himself to death and went out into eternity. Day and night, all he could hear was, Daddy, Daddy, can't you save me? Daddy, Daddy, can't you save me? Let me tell you something. Congregation, there's only one person that can save you. He went through the flames to save you. And he has called us. He has called us to be the rescue party. 
as Jude says, to pull them out of the burning. If we fail, not only have we failed those we love, we have failed our Savior because he's called us to do it. If you're thinking about somebody right now that's lost, you ought to come around this altar and call their name. Say, God, bring conviction on them. God, help me, give me the power, give me the ability, the wherewithal to witness to these people. God, give me the strength, the stamina to do it. You may be the only person that stands between somebody and a crisis eternity. We're going to sing this last stanza. If others need to come, would you come right now? Just as I am and waiting not to. Can you pull it? 